Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to today's webinar, Exploring the Benefits of Low-Loss, High-Bandwidth Tax and Passes. So what you're looking at now is a picture of today's presenters, um, whose voices you'll be hearing for roughly the next 30 to 30 to 45 minutes. I'm Joe McGarvey. I'm the one on the right, and I'll be today's moderator. And joining me in doing most of the driving today are two of ATX's and the industry's most experienced and knowledgeable broadband access subject matter experts. Jay Lee is ATX's Chief Technology and Strategy Officer. Jay's responsible for product development, platform strategy, and operations for all RF access networking solutions. He's been with ATX for more than 20 years and holds bachelor's and master's of science degrees in engineering. Brad Nakari is Vice President of Access Products at ATX. He's been with ATX for nearly 20 years and holds degrees in electrical engineering. In addition to being frequently mistaken for Hugh Jackman, Brad is ATX's RF management guru, and he's done most of the heavy lifting around the recent introduction of ATX's Gig Extend family of two gigahertz hardline passes, which you can be hearing a lot about today. Um, in addition to always being two of the smartest people in the room, Brad and Jay have pretty much seen it all in the cable industry over the past couple of decades. And as I think you'll discover in a few minutes, they have a pretty firm grip on where things are headed. Sorry, apologize for the uh, for the pun uh, at the top. Just couldn't resist that, of course. Um, this is really just a it's a quick snapshot of how this day, today's discussion is going to flow, right? And uh, it's pretty straightforward. And with that, why don't we just uh, start into the presentation? Okay, uh, um, I hope at least some of you out there are old enough to recognize the contents of this slide. This is what a stereo system looked like before you could fit all this equipment and as well as your entire music collection into your back pocket. Uh, this one might even predate me, actually. I don't think I ever owned a reel-to-reel -reel player. Uh, but back in the heyday of hi-fi, you could easily consume a good-sized wall of a room uh, with all of these separate components. You know, the more of them, more of them, and the bigger they are, the better, right, especially the speakers. Uh, I bring this up not just to show how old I am, but to share a mantra that was recited by any self-respecting audiophile of the day, which was, your stereo system is only as good, well, only as sound as good as the weakest component. And you can own the most expensive amp, or preamp for that matter, but Frampton comes alive just isn't going to sound like you're actually at the concert if you don't shell out for the top-of-the-line turntable and speakers. Again, we only mention this to frame today's discussion in an end-to-end -end context. Any access network to achieve peak performance must be precisely tuned from one end of the network to the other. Now, even though today's topic is pretty much focused on, you know, the outside edge of that network, your outside plan, we hope you come away with the sense that adopting a new generation of taps and passes can have an impact on the influence and the cost and performance of your overall network, uh, both today and for decades to come. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay Lee. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Just as we jump into this presentation, I'm, I'm going to uh, step back, provide a little bit of a perspective with respect to the current state of affairs in the industry uh, around the, the HFC architectures that TAPS and PASSES are deployed in today. I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the philosophical approach uh, network architects within MSOs are, are taking uh, as it relates to deploying new products uh, into their networks today. So about 24 months ago, we looked back into the industry. I think a, a concept of node zero was extremely popular with the industry, and it basically contemplated the conversion of existing node serving areas to fiber deep or node zero environments. In this case, it essentially meant that one node serving area served by one node and, and a bunch of amplifiers, a bunch of taps, a bunch of passives would be converted to node zero, whereby one node became 10 to 15 nodes. Uh, amplifiers would no longer exist. And out of a given fiber deep node, the RF signal would feed through coaxial cable as well as taps and passive devices. It would be purely passive uh, beyond the node. The thought process was MSOs would evolve their network to this type of architecture, which enables a technology called full duplex. And once full duplex was deployed, the, uh, 10 gigabits per second bidirectional uh, data rates that everyone is focused on could be achieved. I think as time progressed, uh, MSOs started to realize that you know converting an existing node serving area 
2N plus zero is not only very expensive, but very challenging to, to implement. And, and by no means am, am I here to say that uh, this won't happen. I think it's, it's safe to say, however, it is not happening as quickly as MSOs had forecasted. And well, it's unlikely that it will be deployed ubiquitously across MSOs, HFC networks, um, certainly in the near future. So as, as MSOs started to look at Node, Node Plus Zero and started to realize the, the, the costs and challenges associated with this, they started to look at alternatives with respect to, okay, how, how can I get that 10 gigabits per second uh, capacity I'm after? How can I do it in a more cost-effective manner? And more recently, in the last six to eight months, a concept of extended spectrum docks us into N plus X architectures became very popular. N plus X, of course, is uh, an architecture where you've got a node and then X amplifiers deep behind that given node. So this uh, extended spectrum phenomena really has started to gain a lot of momentum within the last eight months or so. With key touch points being, I mean, Cable Labs has really gotten behind this effort to the point of starting a new specification around DOCSIS, DOCSIS 4.0, which includes the, uh, the concept of extended spectrum. We've seen demos at SCT expos and the like that show uh, vendors producing RPDs that can generate RF spectrum out to 1.8 gigahertz. We've seen a lot of activity in the, in the active space. Uh, hybrid vendors, um, game block vendors are focusing on 1.8 gigahertz uh, solutions today, which is at this point in time the, the frequency that is being contemplated for extended spectrum in the immediate term. But in conjunction with that, we see game block vendors also starting to explore options or solutions around the three gigahertz, which which is sounding like the next logical step on the horizon for extending spectrum. And in conjunction with that, uh, we are seeing some passive vendors including ATX that are focusing on being able to provide bandwidth out past uh, 1.8 gigahertz uh, to support this initiative. The other interesting thing is uh, around extended spectrum, I mean, a lot, a lot of folks see extended spectrum as competitive to, to full duplex, and I guess in their purest form they, they are, but the reality is there are variations around the full duplex standard that can be utilized within the extended spectrum to ultimately enable both technologies to benefit MSOs in the, uh, in the best manner possible. Interestingly enough, as a side note, even from a node, node plus zero architectural standpoint, extended spectrum is definitely a technology that can exist in node zero as long as that node zero plant isn't limited in its bandwidth. So one of the other interesting things around architectural decisions that seems to resonate among all MSOs and become very, very prevalent in the last uh, couple of years is a desire to avoid regrettable spend. MSOs more than ever today are focused on deploying uh, products into their networks that will support a future roadmap. Um, and certainly in the context of extended spectrum, uh, when you start to look at, and this is the premise of our presentation, uh, you start to look at uh, tap, incumbent taps and passive devices in your network, investments in those, investments in upgrading those devices or even replacing those devices is really not uh, aligned with avoiding regrettable spend. We're going to show today that basically taps and passives that are incumbent in your networks today are basically low-pass filters um, or otherwise known as boat anchors from a regrettable spend standpoint. It's certainly our belief and our intentions today to, to demonstrate that deploying a technology today, a TAPS and passive technology today that can support 2 gigahertz, yet ensures a platform capability out to 3 gigahertz is a no-brainer as MSOs move forward in terms of upgrading or replacing uh, these devices in their networks. Once again, Brad will uh, talk about the benefits of these in both Node Zero and Node X environments. So just a quick look at the performance of incumbent taps and passives. We're actually going to contain this part of the discussion to, to taps for the time being. 
the plot you're looking at here is, is basically the RF performance of the through leg on incumbent TAP devices that exist in networks today. This is a collection of the most prevalent devices in networks today. This is also a snapshot of these devices fully upgraded to their current capabilities, which, which currently is uh, 1.2 gigahertz. As you can see in this plot, basically the RF signal is cut off after 1.2 gigahertz. And the desire to use any spectrum above 1.2 gigahertz is basically eliminated. There, there's no ability to pass RF signal uh, through the through leg of, of this tab beyond 1.2 gigahertz. So essentially what you're seeing here is this is very common or, or very similar to uh, the, the frequency response of a low pass filter. This just reiterates the point when you look at a low pass filter type of device from a, from a return loss perspective. Similarly, this tap, once again on its three leg, is acting like a low pass filter. And the last snapshot we provide is what does the RF signal look like as it travels from the coaxial plant to the subscriber? And this is out the, uh, the tap leg of these incumbent taps. So as you can see, performance once again is, is limited to 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, and actually in one case, it, it was less than 1.2 gigahertz. So today's taps you have, in, or MSOs have in their network are, are definitely faceplate upgradable to 1.2 gigahertz. And most incumbent tap vendors today, that is, that is where they've topped out with their technology. Not to say that they couldn't go to another faceplate upgrade, but ATX performed an analysis to say, well, how far can these incumbent taps in these networks actually be pushed? And how does that look based on uh, where MSOs want to go with extended spectrum DOCSIS? So to dig into this a little bit, this is an overview of basically an incumbent tap, and it is comprised of two primary elements. Uh, one element being the base, which is the critical piece. It's the core platform that essentially stays connected within the coaxial network, and it is upgraded to upgrade its frequency performance by plugging a faceplate into that base. And the faceplate is the, uh, the top block in this uh, particular slide. There's some key elements within the, uh, the design or, or structure of these devices. And I'll talk a little bit about those and, and the limitations that they, they bring to the, the overall RF performance of these devices. The first is within the base itself, there are connections that interface with the, uh, the pin connectors from the coaxial network. The, their job is basically to extract RF or inject RF back or to or from the, the RF plant. That RF signal after it is extracted uh, by the base is passed up into the faceplate where, where the RF signal then passes through circuitry in order to perform its tap function as well as its pass-through function. Another important piece of these tap devices is that they pass power. And in order to pass power, they require uh, a device called an AC choke, and they also have a RF-AC bypass element in it so that when a faceplate is removed, RF and power can continue to pass through the, the coaxial network. What's important around all of this is the methodologies with which incumbent taps have been designed around these critical elements that I just discussed. They all create limitations as to how far you can push the bandwidth of existing incumbent taps. So to start with, the power pass AC choke they are basically devices that over time designers have pushed and pushed and pushed to increase their bandwidth capabilities. They are now starting to see their fundamental limitations and there's a phenomenon called self resonances which occur which fundamentally start to limit the uh, RF performance capabilities of, of the passband of the TAP itself. There are the interface connectors between the hardline coax and the tap itself. Traditionally, these have been large masses of metals with, with screws in them. 
uh, this creates a, a significant capacitance effect, which starts to bring in a low-pass filtering effect, which once again impairs the ability for the device to uh, pass higher frequencies. Further, the interaction or the interconnection between the base and the faceplate in these incumbent taps are such that the RF signal is not well controlled and basically housing resonances are enabled, which once again start to limit the upper frequency of the, of the device. And, and finally, the AC bypass, which is, a, which is basically like an antenna, a long string of metal uh, that exists in the base of the housing. Even when it is disconnected from the circuit, it has the ability to pick up RF signals that are passing through the device and once again, resonances start to occur that occur below or, or around 1.2 gigahertz, once again, impairing the upper frequency capabilities of the device. So what we did is we took a look at incumbent devices and said, okay, what happens if you take an incumbent device, like what is, and, and, and strip out all of the performance limiters, what is the absolute best bandwidth you can pass or upper RF frequency you can pass through this device in a perfect scenario. So we actually did a lot of, of tuning work in order to make these the best possible. And as you can see in the, uh, in the results presented here, incumbent devices are performance limited to, depending on the, the, uh, the vendor type, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 to 1.7 gigahertz. So essentially have shown that indeed these incumbent devices are bandwidth limiters or low pass filters. And the first step to extended spectrum docs as being 1.8 gigahertz will not be achievable by trying to upgrade devices installed in, in incumbent networks today. Similarly, we did an analysis around uh, power inserters, uh, splitters and directional couplers and results were, were very similar. I think ultimately folks on the webinar get the point that you just, you're just not going to reach extended spectrum performance with incumbent devices. So I'm going to turn the presentation over now to Brad, who's going to uh, present our, the GigaXtend product line as well as the value proposition around making use of these devices in both Node Plus Zero and Node Plus X architectures. All right. Thanks, Jay. Uh, yeah, I am pleased to present the solutions to all the, uh, the problems and the challenges that Jay just identified. So what we're showing here in the first uh, in the first plot is the typical in-out insertion loss response in red of the incumbent. That's pretty uh, pretty generic for the, the products that are out there. And now we've overlaid the green trace, which is a, a typical Giga Extend, the new tap we are introducing. So much flatter and response basically to three gigahertz. What we're offering here is a three or better gigahertz future-proof platform. The housing circuitry is designed to overcome all the incumbent RF limitations we just discussed. Today, it's a 2 gigahertz extended spectrum performance with the faceplate we have. And that's as the, as the initial product launch. So it'll be agnostic to what your upstream split is, whether you're CAA or DAA architectures. That initial product launch is a 2 gig faceplate that you would future be able to upgrade to a, a 3 gigahertz faceplate if the market ever required it as a, as a simple upgrade. The other uh, major benefit is low loss. So if you were to look at that 1.2 gigahertz area of the curve, the green trace is lower loss than the typical incumbent. Even if you're not going to go into an extended spectrum and stay at 1.2 gigahertz and below, you can save uh, several tenths of a dB per tap and over a cascade, particularly uh, advantageous in a fiber deep uh, cascade with longer tap, tap runs of maybe eight taps in, in a cascade, you really see the benefits of that lower loss. And that really just gets you uh, extra reach and capacity. The extra reach, that makes the fiber deep node placement more efficient, that from one fiber deep node, you can reach uh, a larger territory, and that'll save you CapEx in addition to the, uh, to the OpEx savings. In terms of the features benefits of the product line, uh, it looks very similar to a typical tap that, that you'd be uh, well familiar with. Two, four, and eight port versions of the taps. There are plug-in signal conditioner support for this for cable equalizers, cable simulators, and return path attenuators. These plug-in conditioners are not typically used as much in an N plus X architecture, whether 1.2 gig or lower. 
But in N-plus-0 architectures in particular, with the higher output levels you get from fiber deep nodes and a higher tilt than what is typical in N-plus-X, you do start seeing the need for these conditioners more often, where you'd put in a cable simulator near the node and cable equalizers far away from the node. And the overall result of that is just to get your downstream input to a cable modem or, or the drop flatter across the spectrum. And in the upstream, close to, or far away from the node, because there's less coaxial loss in the upstream as you head back, you need to add that cable equalizer function that, that would, uh, would add some upstream loss to, again, make sure if you do not add that, your cable modems transmitting the upstream far away from the node would transmit too low and you end up with bad CNR. So there's, there's applications uh, today in a, in a fiber deep scenario where you may need to plug in conditioners, but certainly as, as you move to a 1.8 gig extended spectrum with that, with that larger spectrum, we're seeing that there's probably going to be a need for the, the cable plug in conditioners. And certainly we think if you're going to a 3 gigahertz architecture in the future, there's going to be some sort of uh, signal conditioning. So we thought it was, it was very important to include that type of uh, plug-in functionality in the platform today to make sure it was uh, as future-proof as, as we advertised. Some of the other features, it does have the standard ACRF bypass when the faceplate's removed. It's just a design for a 3 gigahertz performance bypass so that when you are either connected or disconnected on that make-before-break bypass, you do not create any resonances in the uh, spectrum below 3 gigahertz. The hum mod performance is as good or better than any of the incumbents out there. The technology we are bringing to this tap does not introduce any worse hum mod. The housing, it's an IP68 rated aluminum housing with uh, nickel pin F connectors to, to cover all environmental uh, impacts. That's pretty typical. Another big feature we have in this is the screwless hardline 90 degree entry connector. So this, uh, again, one of the limitations that Jay brought up was the large screw that's typical when you install a hardline KS stinger into a, an incumbent tap. Most devices we've seen on the market out there require you to take off the extra 90 degree port, the waterproof plug, and put in a screwdriver or a device to tighten a set screw to pinch on the KS stinger, the center conductor. That has the option to loosen off over time, and in a real world, there's technicians out there that just given the, uh, the speed they're doing things, it can be forgotten. It can be forgotten to tighten the connector and you just move on to the next one and you would not hear about that. Potentially, it, it could work on the initial uh, test as you do the deployment and the installation because it's, it's still making contact just roughly even though the, the screw is not tightened. But a week later, it could vibrate or loosen off and now not making contact and you get a, uh, a service call from your customer that your upstream has been disconnected because of that effect. Also, with a loose connection, if you're not very tight on the, uh, the set screw, you can introduce common path distortion impacts, just having that little bit of uh, resistance between the hard line and, and the tap. So our solution does not have any screws. As soon as you put in the, uh, the KS stinger inside the tap, there is a spring-loaded contact that always makes contact with the KS stinger. You can never have a loose screw, and it speeds up the installation because you don't have to remove the other waterproof cap as well, and you don't have to worry about dropping a screw off the strand as you're up in a bucket truck and losing it in the snow. So there's nothing to fall out there and really improves up the uh, installation time. Some of the future that we will bring as we, uh, as we get further with this product line would be drop power on uh, one of the F ports just to supply um, some small cell antennas or any device that would require up to three amps off the AC plant, and that would be a fusible. And we would offer a reverse faceplate options where in situations where the energy, when you're upgrading a plant to an N plus uh, zero plant, in some scenarios, you end up, the new node goes in such a location that it transmits backwards through what was the historical uh, uh, tap cascade. So now you need a faceplate where it's taking what used to be the outport now becomes the import and you need the directional coupler in the opposite direction. So you don't want to turn taps around backwards and then not have visibility of the F ports. So the better solution is to put in a reverse faceplate. In terms of splitters and couplers, very similar in terms of the benefits and the connectors and the way we do the interface between the base and the faceplate. And the KS stingers are also the screwless 90 degree entry port. We have couplers 8, 12, and 16 dB. Everywhere where you see a power passing choke element that passes 15 amps, there is also a fuse not shown in that diagram, but you, it's configurable so that you can drop power to and from any port that is passing AC. We also have splitters two ways three-way and unbalanced three-way splitters and a power inserter that's capable up to 20 amps on the AC input port and then feeding into any given KS RF plus AC port 15 amps out in or the output port. 
and housing is the same, IP68 aluminum housing. So what we're showing here is the same traces that, that Jay showed earlier where we did the incumbent analysis. This was with tap circuitry, not the one where we removed the tap circuitry as a best case scenario. This was the 1.2 gigahertz performance. So you see the roll off in the, uh, the red and the blue trace of the incumbents after 1.2 gigahertz and the green gig extend. Very, uh, very flat, definitely to two gigahertz as the initial product launch and clearly see the platform supports three gigahertz in some of these taps. So we know the technology is there to do it, but uh, the initial product launch is still going to be a, a two gigahertz faceplate that's upgradable in the future and improved to, uh, to a three gigahertz. At isolation, tap to output, you can see the green trace for the gig extend, certainly no, uh, no degradation in tap to, to, uh, to uh, output. So there's no uh, sacrificing that spec. Return loss, again, it's as good or better than, uh, than the incumbent TAP technologies out there. There's no sacrificing return loss. Uh, where you see everyone else is above 1.2 gigahertz, again, turn into that uh, getting close to a 5 dB return loss as part of in, in the rejection region of that low-pass filter. Ours continues with a, a good return loss all the way to 3 gig. So it's a, it's a well-matched 75 ohm device to 3 gig. This slide is showing the other passives and power inserters, couplers, splitters. Just a general overlay, you see the uh, anything dashed is a power inserter. So you can see the roll off again after 1.2 gigahertz in the, in the other colored incumbent devices. And in the green trace, the power inserter is, is very low loss, very flat to, to 3 gig. And the other uh, green traces shown here are just varieties of different coupler values and uh, splitter losses. Same overall concept in, in all of these. It's very flat and lowest possible uh, loss. So the final summary here, uh, just to, to bring this all back to, to, together to one spot. In the N plus zero plant, you gain extended RF reach and extended spectrum uh, ability. And that translates to capacity. The low loss above one, point, uh, above one gigahertz extends this reach, basically allowing you to extend capacity, whether you're deploying FDX or not. Any, any architecture, whether CAA, a centralized access architecture or distributed access architecture. It does give you the most benefits in a distributed access architecture, but still valuable in, in uh, CAA. In the N plus X plant, you gain the extended spectrum and capacity, and it's really just about uh, future-proofing your, your existing plant. Being able to reuse that last mile of coax plant is, is hugely beneficial to customers. You can extending the spectrum without respacing the amps is going to push amp manufacturers to new specification goals for higher total composite output power and lower noise figure inputs. So every dB that you can save with that lower loss, whether 1.2 gig or higher, every dB you can save just makes that, uh, that eventual design goal uh, simpler to do. Flat response taps and passes are gonna be critical to that. And whether this is uh, for a plant upgrade or maintenance mode, replacing incumbent taps, passes with gig extend, it really just makes sense. Whether it's the short term, medium, long term, avoiding regrettable spend at this point by transitioning your plant one by one to gig extend as you do uh, any kind of maintenance window or service impacts. It just avoids truck rolls. You can save a, uh, you hit that tap once, change it out, and you'll never need to adjust that again for probably 10 years or more. So again, this is all, all about avoiding that, uh, that regrettable spend in a limited platform versus putting one in that can take all the futures that are being discussed in the, in the cable TV architectures today. All right. Thanks very much, Brad. Jay, I just wanted to ask um, Jay or Brad, you know, sort of to amplify, I know you talked about, you know, which is sort of literally the money question here is how, how are these, these new next generation of taps and passes going to, you know, save OPEX and, and CAPEX um, in, in both environments, right? Whether it's N plus zero or N plus X. Could you guys go over a little bit, maybe more, sort of specific or describe a scenario in which that's possible? Yeah, sure. I, I can <clears throat> I can take that, Joe. So, you know, just, just looking at, at a node plus zero environment, today if, if operators are converting a node serving area to node plus zero, they are more than likely going to be upgrading their taps and passes with, at a minimum, a faceplate upgrade. So, that's fine. Operators could go and do that. They are rolling a truck to that location regardless. And that's the most expensive piece of doing any work on any element uh, or device in the outside plant. One could argue that rather than doing that faceplate upgrade and getting a 
a solution that gets you to 1.2 gigahertz and getting you a solution that has a higher insertion loss, why not consider swapping out that tap? You're still within the same truck roll. Pop in a device that not only supports 3 gigahertz in the future, it gets you 2 gigahertz today, which means your noted zero environment could potentially support extended spectrum if you decide to go that route. And on top of that, you get more, you get a lesser insertion loss device, which basically translates to a reduced number of node plus zero nodes that you need to deploy in that node serving area. That translates like immediately to uh, CapEx savings because you don't need to install as many nodes and OpEx savings because you're not powering those devices. You know, it's a, it's a pretty significant argument to, to be made there. Similarly, in, in, in an N plus X type of environment, even if you're, if you're just replacing devices that have, have failed or have been compromised in, in some way, shape, or form, why wouldn't you put in a, a device that'll pave the way for the future? Once again, it comes down to the truck roll. You could roll a truck now, replace a, a device that has failed with the same old, same old, and only to have to roll a truck a year and a half later to replace that same old, same old device with a, with a device that'll support up to two gigahertz and extended spectrum. And the MSOs would always have the option at that point to even, if they're going to do a truck roll to one tap, they could do that cascade between amplifiers and change all the taps to a, uh, to a extended spectrum tap. And if you do that for the next five years, by the time you get further into the future, then who knows, maybe 50% of your plant's already converted to a extended spectrum support, and it's uh, a lot less of an issue to then make the call that technology is there, end-to-end -end devices to support extended spectrum, and it's uh, it's a much more trivial uh, procedure at that point to, to replace whatever's remaining in the plant. So. Someone's asking Brad for maybe a little deeper explanation of the, um, the screwless, the, which he refers to here as the seizure screw mechanism. It's the first time I heard that, but is, um, is it something you can expand on a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. So in a, in a typical tap, um, for those that, that, are, that haven't seen these before, if you were to take off the two 90-degree ports, I'm going to go back to a picture of taps so you can see what area I'm describing. So here's a good picture. So if you look at the uh, on the 90-degree ports is what I'm calling these. These are 5 8 inch, 5 8 uh, 24 KS entry ports. If you pull off these waterproof caps here, you unscrew them with a, with a wrench, and you look into these faces, in a typical tap, what you would see is a, a larger metal uh, slug with a hole in it. And if you look, then if you go to the other 90 degree port that's, that's perpendicular to that, you'll see a set screw. So you need to put your KS stinger into one of those. And that, uh, by the way, that set screw, it rotates 90 degrees within the, uh, within the tap. So if you're, if you're coming in from the bottom port, uh, say you're in a pedestal and you need just the way the tap is oriented, you need to bring your hard line into this bottom port, then you would need to swivel that entry connector over to this uh, input port and you'll see the set screw on the on where I'm showing the input port here. So you put your screwdriver in to tighten down. Conversely, if you're more in a strand application overhead, you're probably going to be running straight through on the on the, uh, the in to out legs with the way it's cast here. So you'd need to sw swivel that uh, entry port down to this uh, to this port and, and put your screwdriver into the bottom to tighten that set screw to capture onto that hard line uh, center conductor. So that involves some, there's certainly mechanics involved in that internally with a mass of metal that can spin and have set screws. So that, that's a, a larger piece of metal. And, and then just the, the, the mechanical limitations of any mechanical uh, solution there where the screw can be, if you loosen it too much, the screw will fall out. Uh, if you don't loosen enough, you can't get the KS stinger into it. Uh, so it prevents, it produces those uh, limitations. So what we have done differently, if you were to look into, uh, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have a, a good face-on picture in this presentation. But if you were to look directly into that uh, that round KS entry port, all you're going to see is a white Teflon dielectric with a center hole in in both of those ports, whether you're at the bottom 90 degree or the or the side 90 degree port. So you don't, there is no set screw to tighten. You just insert that KS stinger through the hole in the Teflon and you tighten your KS fitting uh, with wrenches onto the side, and you never need to move that other cap. You never need to remove that other waterproof cap unless you're uh, changing the orientation of the mounting. So it's, it's, that is the benefit. Um, hopefully that's enough of a description.
without showing uh, pictures of what that would look like. Excellent. Okay. Jay, did you spot any other questions there that we can knock yeah, off before? So um... Just to elaborate, you, you touched on the spring-loaded aspect of this. One, one of the okay. other questions was, uh, with no center seizure screw, how is how are you going to hold the center of the pin connector down? So there is, it is a spring-loaded contact. There is a connector would look like kind of like a tower with a, a semicircle on, on the on the top edges of that uh, of that tower port as it passes through in, in either 90 degree direction. So there's always going to be a full contact of that KS stinger on the upper face of that. So it's it's a large metal surface that that stinger is going to uh, be in contact with provided the pressure from the bottom is applied, and that's the, the spring element. So it would be a, a metal, almost like a ball bearing, if you can picture that, internal tunnel of the of the connector, and it's pressed up by a beryllium copper spring. So we've done the uh, the testing we've done. We're adhering to all the, the center conductor seizure forces that the SCT defines, which is a 150 gram retention force over the possible range of diameters of that KS stinger. So, so we're, we're well within those specs that we can apply a very strong 150 gram uh, uh, retention force through, through that center conductor based on that spring-loaded contact pushing up on the, uh, on the KS stinger. Next question, Brad, is uh, availability of the Giga Extend solution. So we are actively doing trials right now with the product. Uh, we are looking for a general availability to uh, to take orders in the, the fall. So we're looking to do Q4 of this year, probably as early as, as October, we would be done all uh, all our internal testing and trials uh, should be complete. I don't see any more questions from the audience, but like I said, if, if something occurs to you um, after the this concludes or if you're watching a replay, please drop us a question to uh, marketing at atx.com and we'll make sure it gets to the right person and gets back to you. We're going to conclude right now. Just want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Jay and Brad, for your, uh, for your presentation and uh, hope everyone has a, a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.